So yesterday, we finished this example, yes? And I think we finished yeah. it with a, maybe a minute to spare. I wasn't totally writing it down as the bell rang, I don't think. You know, maybe, maybe not. But um, with this, we are using the difference quotient. And with this one, I demonstrated, okay, <coughs> plugging in the A value, the 3, from the beginning, being able to work that through. And what we were able to find here is we found the slope. And so the slope of the curve is 6 at the point 39. Which, if you think about it, makes sense. Because at that point, the parabola is starting to go up pretty steep. So we have a pretty steep tangent line, slope of 6. Okay, right here, and we really should have tried to squeeze this in yesterday, but I forgot, because this goes along with it. Yes? Um, so if you're doing an example, like example 4, and your coordinates are 0, 0, would you just plug in 0? Yes. I mean, in this case, at the coordinate 0, 0, because this is a parabola, that, I mean, at this point, the parabola goes like that, right? So the tangent line here would be a horizontal, well, it would be a horizontal tangent line, which has slope of 0. I don't know. I, I would assume so. You'd plug in 0, 0. Or, it kind of, it depends on the situation because if it's you know a different equation that could change things up and so I mean like in this case it would be zero and that's what I'm trying to think would using the difference quotient work or would it not and that's I'm struggling with processing that on the fly So I'm really not 100% sure. Sorry. I don't have a good answer there. I really don't. Okay. Um, this writing equations of tangent lines. You guys know how to write an equation. You have to have a point. You have to have a slope, right? And with that in mind, last year definitely Algebra 2 sum, I really forced you guys to use that point slope form. And the point slope form you are familiar with was, I don't know where I want to write this, but when I say point slope, your brain probably says y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Yes? Actually, I should have put it down here is what I, where I should have put it. Now, as you look here, um, remember, writing the equation of line requires a point and a slope, what I just mentioned here. It follows we should be able to write an equation for the tangent line through a given point since we can find the slope by the limit process. And we're given either a point or an x-coordinate. In calculus, now, I've seen calc teachers do this both ways. Okay, um, In calculus, we'll focus on using the point-slope form of a line. However, notice this point-slope for, point form of a line. Slightly different, yes? Now, it's only different by one thing, and I've seen several calculus teachers that prefer to use it this way. If I take this equation right here, the point slope you know, and I solve it for y, how do I get y by itself? You add y1 over to the other side. Well, if we add y1 over to the other side, does what we know now match with this? And it does. Now, I personally, I'm not going to say you have to do it this way. There's pros and cons. I mean, there are some advantages in calculus if you can just go straight to this method. Um, I know one of the big presenters on when they do the AP Lives um, through, what do I want to call it, the College Board site? The, my AP. My AP, the A. I can't even think of what I want to call it there, but when they do the AP Live through there, one of the big presenters, I know he always uses this form. So it's good to be familiar with, understand the connection here, right? If you can understand the connection, it's a pretty easy transition, okay? 
really, if they say write the equation as a line and they don't tell you what form, you can use whatever form you want, technically. Okay? So, now, with this all said, write the equation of the tangent line for y equals x squared at the point 3, 9. Well, we have a point, yes, which means we have an x and a y coordinate. What else do we need? We need a slope. What slope did we find? Problem up above. We found the slope to be 6, yes? So, with that in mind, start if you want writing your, the equation with the point slope form you're used to using. If we do that, we're going to say y minus, what's our y coordinate? 9 equals m, which is 6 times x minus 3. It just says write the equation with the tangent line. That is valid. Okay? Um, when, you look at the, when you look at any of her answer keys, she's going to have the 9 on the other side. She's going to add the 9 over and say y equals 6 times x minus 3 plus 9. And you'll see this because you can still see that ordered pair of 3, 9. It's the 3 is your x value opposite the sign because it's in the parentheses, then the 9, slope of 6. So you can still see all the information. Okay. Officially, since it says write the equation in the tangent line, could you continue into slope intercept? You could. Okay, there's nothing, there's no right or wrong, you know, form here. So you could say what? 6x minus 18 plus 9. So 6x minus 9 would be the full equation of the line. I like this. You should have just the bigness all year. This you like the algebra connection here is what you're saying. I like the two, I like the two step problem. <laughs> if only it stayed that easy, right? Okay, at the bottom of this page, just a little bit of information. <clears throat> Since the slope of a tangent line is a limit, this is a good place to discuss what happens when limits fail to exist. The slope of the tangent line might not exist because the limit doesn't exist. So there we're talking vertical asymptotes, a point discontinuity, what else did they oscillating function, so when it's going up and down, up and down type thing, or because a tangent line has a vertical slope. So occasionally we'll run into a tangent line where, you know, you end up having to draw a vertical slope. So in the case of a tangent line that exists but has an undefined slope, that is basically the case of a vertical tangent line, we will use the following definition. And so this mentions if F is continuous at A, in other words, we're not talking vertical asymptote here. If f is continuous at a, the limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a over h is going to be equal to positive and or negative infinity, depending on the situation. Okay? Because that vertical tangent line is going up to infinity, right? And down to negative infinity. Then the line x equals a is a vertical tangent line to the graph of f. So this idea that x of a is a vertical line, this is going to happen when you end up with 0, no, reverse it, some number divided by 0, right? Yeah. Some number divided by 0. Because remember, 0 divided by a number is 0. Like when we talk about slope, 0 on top is a 0 slope if you have no rise. When 0 is on bottom of slope, that is undefined, okay? So just the idea that a number divided by zero is going to result, <clears throat> excuse me, in a vertical tangent line, okay? Okay. Continuing on. Did I introduce the word normal last year? I don't think we introduced normal in pre-calc. I think we only introduced normal in calc. I'm processing through on the spot. Sorry. Okay. So I don't think you've heard the word normal in terms of math. 
okay? But normal is a calc way for saying perpendicular. So what's a perpendicular? What's perpendicular mean? If two lines are perpendicular, they meet how? 90 degree angle, yes? So if you are asked to find the normal line, you are asked to find the perpendicular line. I guess it says perpendicular right there, but normal line is the line perpendicular. Now, interesting enough, when I was listening to her notes, she threw in another word that you guys did learn last year in pre-calc for perpendicular. And this is when we were doing um, vectors at the end. Did you remember the word orthogonal? Yeah. Not that you necessarily remember what it meant. But do you remember me using the word orthogonal? Okay. And we talked about knowing if vectors were orthogonal because their dot product was zero. I know. Words from, you know, sounds like eons ago at this point. But orthogonal is another word. I don't, I've never seen that in calculus necessarily, but it's a word to throw out there. Um, when we talk perpendicular, if you see me do an upside down T, that is a perpendicular symbol. Okay, so just kind of be aware there. So normal line to a curve at a point is the line perpendicular to the tangent line at that point. To find the slope of the normal line, use the opposite reciprocal of the slope of the tangent line. So the idea here, you've got your tangent line, the normal line being perpendicular to it, specifically perpendicular to it at that point. You guys know back from technically probably Algebra 1, Perpendicular slopes are opposite reciprocals, right? Change the sign, change the reciprocals. Something that can also be said is that perpendicular slopes, what do they multiply to be? If they're opposite reciprocals, they multiply to be not one, but negative one, right? Because reciprocals multiply to be one. Opposite of positive times a negative is going to multiply to be negative. So when we talk about um, perpendicular lines, they have opposite reciprocals, they multiply to be negative 1. Okay, so this page, we're going to talk about slope, we're going to write an equation for tangent line, normal line, but before we do that, we have to have a way to find slope, right? And we're basically, we haven't defined it to be that yet, but we're using the definition of derivative here. Now, A asks us to use the limit definition to compute the slope of the tangent line at x equals a. So we're not putting a specific number in yet, yet being the keyword. We're just finding basically <laughs> our formula for slope. So there's our given function. Limit definition. The limit, do you remember it? As h approaches 0 of... And actually, I think I'm going to write it over here to get us started so I can point to it. Limit as h approaches 0 of f of a plus h minus f of a all over h. Okay. So, f of a plus h. Thoughts on what f of a plus h is? If my function is f of x, which is 1 over x plus 3. What do you got? 1 over a plus h plus 3. Okay. So 1 over a plus h plus 3. Fun. Minus. f of a. What's f of a? So I have 1 over x plus 3. It's going to be 1 over a plus 3. All over h. Okay, guys. That's the algebra skills here. The big bad algebra skills, though. Are you ready? Because we have to clean that up. Right now, if I put 0 in, I'm going to get 0 over 0. We're in that indeterminate form. We can't be in that indeterminate form. So, now, you will notice, good habit, 
you will always see me rewrite at the beginning of my statement the limit as h approaches zero. Until I actually take that limit, you should be in the habit, I know it's annoying, rewrite it. So we know it's still a limit. Now, okay, one thing I'm going to do, this h is a denominator, yes? I'm going to pull that denominator of h out front as just 1 over h. Okay? I might actually do this an extra step with you guys. So I'm pulling 1 over h out front because dividing by h is multiplying by 1 over h. Agree? Dividing by h. Do we need... Dividing by h is the same as multiplying by... 1 over h, right? That whole reciprocal thing. Now, how much can you guys handle? Because the next part, and I can do this in two steps, or we can go ahead and do it now, is we need to put these fractions on top together as one fraction. So what's the common denominator going to be with these two fractions? And the common denominator is a plus h plus 3 times a plus h because they have different pieces added. So my common denominator, a plus h plus 3 times a plus 3. Did I say the right thing? I think I might have said it wrong. I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. I think I forgot there was a number in there. That's my common denominator for these two fractions on top. Are you with me? Now, I don't know, do you guys remember? Should I teach this properly or should I teach shortcut here? Because the idea is when you're adding and subtracting fractions, you know how you can kind of cross it? Because you can use that here. The idea that this first fraction is going to be 1 times a minus 3, which is just Excuse me, I said A minus 3, didn't I? Gosh. So if you want here, I'll call it 1 times A plus 3. We're subtracting, so now minus. And then it's, second one is 1 times A plus H plus 3. And with that technique, guys, Multiply numerator times denominator minus multiply denominator times numerator over the denominators multiplied. Yes? That's the technique I just used. Let's do some cleanup. Some serious cleanup. So the limit is h approaches 0. 1 over h is just out front, hanging out, waiting for something to happen. Denominator is staying a plus h plus 3 times a plus 3. General rule of thumb, don't usually multiply those denominators out. Usually there's something that's going to cancel or something nice is going to happen later, so don't multiply them out. Okay, numerator. You see what's happening in the numerator? I mean, officially, if I write it all out, this 1 times a, 1 times 3 is what? That's a plus 3, right? This is being subtracted, so this is really minus a, minus h, minus 3. What's going to happen in the numerator? Yeah, there's some canceling activity, right? A cancels with A, 3 cancels with 3. What are we left with? The minus H, negative H, which is going to cancel with this H out here. So I'm going to go ahead and write the limit as H approaches 0. If I'm doing too many steps for you, condense it to, to your heart's desire. 1 over H on top, I still have negative H. On bottom, I still have a plus H plus 3 times A plus 3. Okay. 
H's will cancel, yes. When H's cancel, negative H just be is left as a negative 1, correct? Which I just realized I forgot. What is this we're finding the whole time? This is slope, yes? I didn't put it that way, but this is slope. So the limit as H approaches 0 of what remains? Negative 1 on top. A plus H plus 3 times A plus 3 on bottom. Now that I have this h out of the denominator here, can we actually take the limit? That, you know, because that's the whole thing. If the limit is as h approaches 0, but my denominator is h times thing, that's just going to make my denominator 0. That's not really helpful. So now, to take the limit as h approaches 0, direct substitution. Every place you see an h, we're going to replace it with 0. Well, if you replace that with 0, what is this limit? We have negative 1 on top. What do we have on bottom? A plus 3 times A plus 3, which properly written is A plus 3 quantity squared. And that represents our slope. Now, that is our slope when x equals A. Okay. And I don't know if you guys recall yesterday or not. I'm going to go back for just a moment. This last problem I did yesterday. I kind of hesitated on the fly how I wanted to handle this problem. Okay, I opted to do things differently than what um, is shown in the official notes. Because when she shows in the official notes, she started this all off with A. So she didn't plug the 3 in here. She worked this whole problem with A. And then down here, it gets to be, I think it's 2a, and then she plugs in 3. So the idea that the slope anywhere on this curve was 2a. Okay? Well, the idea we have on the problem we're working, for this equation here, the slope anywhere on the curve is this right here which means this equation has multiple uses, right? Because I can take, I can find any slope I want now. For instance, B, what does part B ask us to do? <coughs> find the slope of the curve at x equals negative 1. Do we have to go back and work this whole limit definition again? No. Instead of x equals a, x is now equal to negative 1. So you're going to take negative 1 and plug it in place of... I'm going to go, I think I have B on the next screen, so I have room to write. I do. So the slope from the previous page was negative 1 over A plus 3 squared, right? So do some math. That was weird. So it's negative 1 over... A plus 3, so negative 1 plus 3, quantity squared. Negative 1 plus 3 is 2. 2 squared is 4. We have a slope of negative 1 fourth. Okay? C. You guys don't need me for C. Pull out your algebra skills. Pull out what we just did a little bit on the other page. Write the equation of the tangent line to the curve at x equals negative 1. Well, tangent line. We need a slope and a point. What's our slope? Negative one-fourth. Okay, that's the slope of the tangent line at negative one. And we need a point. Well, 
I know my point is negative 1 comma something. Okay. Slight issue. How do I find something? You do know. No? We're going to put it in point slope here in a moment, but we have to have the point first. What was our original equation we were working with? Was it 1 over x plus 3? Right? And so, if you're trying to find the y value, plug in your x value. So 1 over negative 1 plus 3, which is 1 half. So the ordered pair is actually negative 1 comma 1 half. We have the information we need. Point in a slope. Right? Anytime they give you an x value, to find the other half of that point, you plug it back into the original equation. Which point slope do you want me to write? Or do you want me to write both of them? I don't know what you guys are thinking here. In our previous ways, we would write y minus what? 1 half equals negative 1 fourth x minus negative 1, so x plus 1. However, <coughs> The calc answer key is going to say y equals negative one fourth times x plus one and then plus one half. Equivalent, right? Okay, what about d? Write the equation of the normal line. Thoughts? That's the slope of four. Agree? He says it has a slope of four. So M sub norm, that's a way of just saying, okay, that's the normal slope, however you want to write it, I don't care. But <coughs> the opposite reciprocal is positive four <laughs> over one. So positive four. So write an equation. I can write y minus 1 half equals 4 times x plus 1. Or I can write y equals 4 times x plus 1 plus 1 half. Okay, E. Use the equation from... C to estimate the value of x equals negative 1.1. So C, I grab this equation right here. This is negative 1.1, doesn't it? I think I'm going to, so I'm going to say we're doing f of negative 1.1. I'm going to go to decimals so I can think decimals here. Negative 1 fourth is negative 0.25. X, what am I putting in for X? Negative 1.1 plus 1 plus a half. So plus 0.5. And I only went decimals because they gave me a decimal, right? So my brain's going to mesh better if I have it all in decimals. If I follow order of operations... Negative 1.1 plus 1 is negative 0.1. And you could grab the calc there too at this point, but negative 0.25 times negative 0.1 is going to be positive 
0.025. So then when you add 0 0.025 and 0.5, we should be 0.525. That's good math to be able to kind of process through, though, isn't it? I'm with you guys. I'm all about checking on my calculator. I don't ever trust myself. I always want to check on the calculator, just like you guys. So, calculus, is fo calculus focuses me, to, or forces me to not check as much. But now, real quick. This whole big thing, okay? I'm trying to decide how I want to do this, sorry. If we think about this whole graph, okay, I'm just gonna kind of do a sketch for you here. Our original graph was f of x equals 1 over x plus 3, correct? Right here, so I have it. So what's the graph of 1 over x look like? That's one we know. Let me rephrase that. That's one that we should know. 1 over x? Huh? Not parabola. <laughs> I'm sorry, all I can do is laugh because you guys are all like doing your own little thing. And okay, so it's, I gotta think, am I doing the right, it's the two curves that yeah. go out like this. Am I, the normal one is in quadrants one and three. Am I in quadrants one and three to you guys? Yeah, because I'm not to me, so. Quadrants one and three. Now, what does the plus three do? The plus three in the denominator takes the x, takes you and moves you left or right opposite the sign. So that means that Basically, there's going to be a vertical asymptote here at negative 3. And then your graph, the one that's in first quadrant scoots over, the one that's in quadrant 3 scoots over, looks something like that, right? That's a good graph to be able to process mentally. Now, We were using this equation to estimate the value of negative 1.1. Well, right here, so when x is negative 1.1, so we're looking right there, okay? That's where we're using the graph to estimate. Now, Sorry, there's a disconnect in my head somewhere here. There we go. So if you recall, this equation we just used, okay? Sorry, I had to process it all. Something wasn't connecting for the moment in my head. This equation we just used was all about being at x equals negative 1, yes? We were using, and so this is based on, you know, if you think about this dot being negative 1, but then the slope of this, tan, you know, it's based on, the slope of the tangent line right there. Now, we used this equation, which is the tangent line, right? It's not the actual curve. We used the equation to estimate negative 
Now, when we estimate that negative 1.1, keep in mind negative 1.1 is a little farther along, isn't it? Well, to estimate, we're on the green line here. This estimate is based on what the value is on the green line. Is that going to be exactly what it is on the actual blue curve? And it's not. If we were to plug this into the actual curve, then it would be doing well at negative one. No, not what I want to say here. I don't think I have this written in my notes right because I wrote <coughs> yeah. Negative one point one plus three. I think when you plug that into the calculator you get approximately 526. What did we get as our estimate? We got 525. 525 was the estimate on the tangent line. 526 is the exact value on the curve. Are we close? Yeah, and this was, it did say to estimate there, didn't it? Okay, notice our tangent line is a little bit below our curve. So, this estimate is what we would call an underestimate. And that is important in calculus at times to be able to understand that this is an underestimate. I know without ever doing the actual math, because my tangent line is below my curve, I know that this answer is going to be estimated a little bit on the small side. Okay? Sorry, I'm really confusing myself because in here, I just wrote negative 1 plus 3. This is not working for me. That's why I was so confused for a moment. Okay. I think we have one more page, right? <coughs> yep. Okay. Time to own it, she says. We'll try, right? <clears throat> so, in this example here, given the graph of the function f of x equals 4x minus x squared shown, determine how fast is the graph changing at x equals 1. That is, so when we talk about how fast is the graph changing, slope represents average rate of change, right? Or instantaneous rate of change, excuse me. But slope in general rep represents rate of change. So, that is, what is the slope at of the tangent line at x equals 1. Now, A says use your calculator. Yay. Don't get too excited over there, Megan. Okay, use your calculator to evaluate the average rate of change. So remember, average rate of change is basically just slope of regular slope of a line. Between the points 1, f of 1, and 1.001, f of 1.001. And it says, be sure to show the difference quotient. If I think back to slope, right, y minus y over x minus x, well, I don't have the y values right now, but I can use f of 1.001 minus f of 1 over 1.001 minus 1. Okay, and that is just using... Um, just the information they gave us. Now, this is where your calculator comes into play, yes? And this is where you could plug, I don't know what I think. I haven't done anything with the calculator for a bit. If you wanted to, you could make one of your equations Like you could put, what is my equation? You remember me talking about this, 4x minus x squared? You could put it into y1. And you remember how I showed you you can use that to calculate? So I typed in 4x minus x squared into y1. Then we go back to my main calculation screen. I could go ahead and set up a fraction bar. I can do y1, which my shortcut is alpha f4. I can do y1, parentheses, evaluate at 
minus y1 again, evaluate it at 1, over 1.001 minus 1. So I can type that all in the calculator right there. And we get an answer of 1.999. And this is our average rate of change. <clears throat> Why what? Why didn't we limit the F times A plus H times F of A? We'll get there. Okay. And really, in this case, we have the two endpoints. Okay, we have, you know, they asked us to do between one and one point zero zero one. The limit is more when we don't have the two endpoints. Okay, and we're just looking at as h approaches zero, as it gets closer and closer, which is b. Notice b says find the average rate of change again. Yes, but it's between the points one f of one and. 1 plus h and f of 1 plus h. In other words, we don't know those values, right? So, this is where we are going to do the limit as h approaches 0. And limit written down here. Hmm? Was I asleep when I did these notes? I'm so confusing myself here. They made sense a while ago, but man, I'm, I'm sorry, that's rough on me today. I'm not sure what my excuse is. Am I misleading? I think I'm misleading here. So, hmm. Huh? Sorry, guys. I'm having to figure out what my brain process was here. I didn't use the limit, and this is where I'm trying to process. Why didn't I use the limit? Maybe. Uh, let's see. So C says, there we go, okay. C says as H goes to zero. So that's when we're going to apply the limit. Sorry, guys. I told you. I'm, it's rough. I don't, have a, I don't have a valid excuse. I'm just struggling today, okay? We all have our struggles. This is mine today. Sorry. Deal. Don't apologize. <laughs> we're allowed our struggles, right? Okay. I just have to have my struggles in front of the entire class. So good thing it's a class of seven. So it's a class of seven. Okay. So what we're trying to do here, guys, is we are trying to do the um, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. We're doing that part of our average rate of change. We will, oh no, <laughs> we will do the limit here in the next part. Yes? Okay, so why are we using this one beyond what we just did? Well, the difference here is, the big difference is we have the 1 plus h. We don't have a value. Okay? Here, we had a value. We can't use this. Or we can't use this. Which way do I want to say this? We can't use this one here, down here, because we don't have a value. We have an h. Okay? Whereas over here, we had a value. And that's why we could. Sorry. 
my this's are backwards here and everything but okay so to find this now what you've got to realize here my a value is essentially one so they provide us with one the a value is one so when we think Okay, I'm trying to give you guys the connections here. These are ordered pairs. are like the A, F of A. And A plus H, F of A plus H. In all honesty, we could think about it like that top, though. Because here's thought. This H is equivalent to A plus H minus A, correct? Valid? So, okay, I wrote that we were going to use this. I kind of skipped over the detail of why just H, and this is where Connor's question and confusion was. Valid, so. But if we do F of A plus H minus F of A, that's a numerator. On bottom, if we do A plus H minus A, what is that going to clean up to be? That's going to clean up to be H every time, isn't it? So maybe I should have just put it that way. And in fact, I think I will over here just to kind of show it, okay? F of A plus H minus F of A. What is F of A plus H? We're going to use F of 1 plus H minus F of A. What am I using in plus of F of A? In place of F of A? F of 1. And we'll come back and fill these in here in a moment. And then on bottom... Instead of A plus H, I'm going to say 1 plus H minus, instead of A, I'm going to say 1. That, numer that denominator is going to clean up to H, yes? Now, we've got to do all the filling in here, guys. What is F? F is 4X minus X squared, right? So, F of 1 plus H, 4 times... 1 plus h minus x squared, so minus 1 plus h squared. That right there. Nope. Okay, I didn't like that. F of 1 plus h. F is 4x minus x squared. So I've got to take 1 plus h and plug it in up here. Okay. Every place I see x, I'm replacing with 1 plus h, right? So 4 times 1 plus h instead of 4x, and minus x squared becomes minus 1 plus h squared. Okay, Minus f of 1. That means we're plugging 1 into our equation up there, right? So minus the quantity, 4 times 1, minus 1 squared. All over, what is 1 plus h minus 1? h. Okay, we got to do some algebra. 4 times 1 is 4, plus 4 times h is 4h. I've got a FOIL. But I'm also going to subtract. So 1 squared, so minus 1, 1h, and 1h is 2h, so minus 2h, and minus h squared. And down here, 4 times 1 is 4, minus 1 is 3, so minus 3, all over H. Okay, on top, we have some cleanup happening, a little bit, not much. 4 minus 1 minus 3. Are you with me if I say 4 minus 1 minus 3 cancels? So then I have left 4H. Oh, we can go ahead. What's 4H minus 2H? So how about if I say 2H minus H squared all over H? Is that good? Factor out an H on top. So H times 2 minus H all over H. 
the H's will cancel. And my slope is represented as, or my average rate of change, which is slope of the secant line, is represented as 2 minus H. And of course, that is as long as H can't equal 0 in the process, because H was in my denominator. Now, that was average rate of change between the points. Okay, move on to the next. Because the next piece says what happened to the secant lines between those two points we just used as h goes to zero. So this is the limit as h approaches zero of what did we just have? 2 minus h. The limit as h approaches zero, what do we do? Every place you see an h, you replace it with zero. And so this becomes 2. As h approaches 0. So as h is getting closer and closer and closer to 0. Oh. And we can put, put it, do a direct substitution, even though h will never actually equal 0, valid point, as long as it doesn't cause a problem in the math. Okay? Now, let me point out real quick. What do we get on part A? 1.999. Is that just about 2? Okay. Now, it asks us to find a general formula for finding the slope of the tangent line at any point by using these points. So, the idea of our limit as h approaches 0 business, right? Limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. The difference is we're using x's instead of a's. We're kind of redoing what we did up in part b. Okay, We're going to use that same equation of y equals 4x minus x squared. Isabel, get, oh, I got a moment. So our function y equals 4x minus x squared, or if you prefer, f of x equals 4x minus x squared. So let's do our limit here. The limit as h approaches 0. f of x plus h. Every place I see an x, I'm replacing with x plus h. So since it's 4x, we're going to do 4 times x plus h minus x squared. But I'm not using x, I'm using x plus h. So instead of minus x squared, minus x plus h squared. Minus f of x in general. What is our f of x? 4x minus x squared. Notice at the end I always put that whole thing in parentheses. All over h. Limit as h approaches 0. A lot of this is going to be similar to up the top. 4x plus 4h minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared minus 4x plus x squared. In the end, this is going to clean up to be 4 minus 2x. Okay, um, I'm going to keep writing it out. You're welcome to stay or go. You guys can go. I know you guys have a class to get to, but I'm going to go ahead and work it out so it's on the video at least. In that, let's see, 4x cancels with 4x, minus x squared plus x squared. Everything left has an h, so it's the limit as h approaches 0 of 4h minus 2xh minus h squared all over h. That same thing we have done where an h cancels out, I'm going to factor an h out. 
Let me as h approaches 0 of h. If I factor the h, it's 4 minus 2x minus h all over h. h is cancel. Almost there. I have the limit as h approaches 0 of 4 minus 2x minus h. But when I put in h as 0, we end up with 4 minus 2x. Okay, and that is our slope of the tangent line. Okay, guys, obviously do the homework for tomorrow. Thanks for sticking around. No one wanted to get up and leave, I take it? Maybe you wanted to, just no one did.